Hi, I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Kristen Iverson. She's the author of three books, including Full Body Burden, Growing Up in the Shadow of Rocky Flats. Today we're going to talk about Rocky Flats. So thank you for being on the program and thank you for your work. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. So tell tell me and especially the audience about about Rocky Flats. What what is Rocky Flats and what's the what's the big deal of growing up in its shadow? Well, when I was a kid growing up in in Colorado and this is this is an area just um uh north of Denver, kind of between Denver and Boulder, so it's a highly populated area. When I was a kid, we had no idea uh, what Rocky Flats was. Um, We grew up next to the plant, um, rode our horses in the fields and swam in the lakes and, you know, we're outside all the time. Um, And then later, um, like many of the kids in my neighborhood, I went to work at Rocky Flats myself. It was considered you know, one of the best jobs in town. And even then, I didn't fully understand uh, what was going on. It was very top secret. When I was a kid, uh, the plant was owned and operated. It was owned by the AEC, now the DOE, Department of Energy, uh, and operated by Dow Chemical. And the rumor in our neighborhood was that they were making household cleaning supplies. And my mother thought for years that they were making scrubbing bubbles. They were not making scrubbing bubbles. From uh, 1953 to 1989, Rocky Flats secretly produced more than 70,000 plutonium pits or triggers for nuclear weapons, essentially the heart of every nuclear weapon in America. And each one of these uh, pits are about the size of a small grapefruit, slightly flattened. Each one, each one of those 70,000 contains enough breathable particles of plutonium to kill every person on Earth. And we had no idea what was going on out there. We had no idea that there was extensive radioactive and toxic contamination in the environment, most particularly plutonium, which is of course, highly highly dangerous and has a half life of twenty four thousand years. Um, but there were there were other things as well, including americium, tritium, strontium, uh, carbon tetrachloride, uh, and we had no idea that we were being exposed to any of these things. And um, it was all a very top secret operation. And um, I think we can presume that um as has 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 been shown at Hanford and Fukushima and Chernobyl that um the technicians and technocrats and bureaucrats and everybody else associated with it was able to keep the plutonium completely contained and not harm or irradiate anyone else is this is this correct well, at, at the risk of, of your reader, your listeners missing the irony, of course it's correct. No, of course not. Um, as we've seen, sadly, uh, at all these other places, um, and certainly, certainly at Rocky Flats, uh, it's very difficult to contain and control plutonium and other radioactive and toxic elements once it gets into the environment. Um, it's very difficult to remove, impossible. Um, really, there has never been any off-site cleanup at Rocky Flats. Uh, and the on-site cleanup, which um, was declared complete in 2006, is very, very controversial. And uh, there's still a lot of stuff out there. And, and of course, once um, this stuff is in the environment, once you have plutonium in the environment, you begin to see health effects. In uh, in a local population, you know, even in in animals, uh, there was strontium ninety um, found in the bones of horses right down the street from our house, for example. Uh, there were rabbits that had uh, high levels of radiation in their feet uh, to the present day, for example. Um, but of course, the most uh, dangerous aspect of it is to you know, the human population and in long term effect in the environment and. Uh, 
in the area around Rocky Flats and directly downwind of Rocky Flats, we see higher rates of leukemia, lymphoma, lots of uh, thyroid issues. Um, everyone in my family has thyroid problems, lots of thyroid cancer, brain tumors, uh, and other things as well, and and a lot of um, not just of course uh, very, quite serious, very serious um, diseases, but also a lot of autoimmune stuff uh, that's kind of hard to pinpoint and certainly hard to treat. So it's a it's a big problem at Rocky Flats, and and one of the biggest problems, um, certainly in my opinion, is that there has never been any public health monitoring of people who live around Rocky Flats. There's never been any kind of resource avail available to people who report health issues, uh, you know, going all the way back to the 1950s right up to the very present day with uh, children uh, in particular. And um, there's never there's never been any um, resource available to them. If you know, there, there's. I want to say that I find that extraordinary, but the but the sad truth is, in many ways, I I don't find that extraordinary because that's that sort of arrogance and uh, lack of concern is something that we've seen in many different areas about many different subjects. And but I, I want to, and I do want to talk about the, the the health effects more. But I want to back up for a second and talk about um, there were in addition to the day to day. Um, dangers of exposure to such highly, such a high, highly toxic materials. In addition, there were two catastrophic um, failures at Rocky Flats, at least that we know of. So, can you talk about the two fires? Yeah, um, these were really uh, devastating fires. Um, over the course of 38 years of, of production, there were more than 200 fires at Rocky Flats, actually, and there was never any warning, never any evacuation, uh, and almost no information available to the public. Uh, and later AEC reports, Atomic Energy Commission reports, noted that there, in at least one case, and, and probably two in these two particular fires, there should have been evacuation. Um, but there was not. The The biggest fire, the worst fire, was in 1957. That was before I was born. Uh, that fire was so extreme, it burned out. Um, it happened in a primary a plutonium production building, and it was so extreme, it burned through all the filters, the plenums that uh, are supposed to protect radioactive and toxic material from getting out into the air. Uh, and it also burned through all of the measuring equipment, it was a devastating fire, and we'll never know exactly how much material was released into the Metro Denver area from that fire. Uh, immediately after that fire, there was a jump in childhood leukemia uh, and a number of other uh, health effects. But um, it's, you know, of course, the um, AEC and the companies that operate Rocky Flats denied that there's a direct link. And, of course, there was very little information available to the, very little information, almost nothing uh, available to the public. The second fire happened um, right after my family moved out uh, to Rock, near Rocky Flats. We, um, I, I've spent my entire childhood near the plant. We had a small house in what's now called Old Arvada. And then when I was 11 or so, we moved to a new house um, nearly adjacent to Rocky Flats where there was a lot of new uh, development going on. And uh, my parents bought a new house and they were just thrilled. It was their dream. They thought they were going to be raising their four children in the perfect environment. On May 11th, 1969, uh, Mother's Day, we were out having Mother's Day brunch at an Italian restaurant sitting outside in the area, and we had no idea that there was a fire at the plant. We didn't even know that the plant was there, and we had no idea that a radioactive cloud was traveling over our head. That fire, like the 1957 fire, was so extreme that it raced through the production line, basically an assembly line for triggers. There was a lot of plutonium in that line. And uh, burned through the line, burned through the plenums, the filters, um, burned through the measuring equipment. And again, it was a very, very um, extreme uh, incident. At that point in time, it, it was the most um, severe, most serious industrial accident that had ever happened in the United States. And, you know, one thing I might add about that fire, 
is that we came very close to a Chernobyl-like incident. The fire was so hot um, that it literally melted the roof of the plutonium production building, and that roof began to slowly rise like uh, like a marshmallow bubble. And uh, of course, it's it's very difficult to fight a plutonium fire. You can't use water on plutonium without risking a criticality or a nuclear chain reaction. So there, it's very difficult to fight. You have to be very, very careful, and it's very dangerous to be a firefighter in that kind of situation. And um, we came within seconds of that roof breaching, breaking, in which case, if it had happened, um, honestly, I would not be here talking to you today about this. Uh, but what happened, a couple of things happened um, that were very lucky. Uh, one thing is that there were a couple of very uh, brave firefighters who went up on the roof and were using water on the roof and, and thought they probably would lose their lives in the process. But the biggest thing that happened was that there was a young firefighter uh, behind the wheel of a fire truck, and I think he was probably nervous and, and a little scared, and he accidentally put the truck in reverse instead of forward, and he backed into a power pole, and that knocked out the power to the building and uh, that was driving the fans that was pushing that fire through that plutonium line. So it gave, uh, it gave the firefighters a little bit of a break, and that roof began to uh, come down a little bit, and we did not have, we did not have uh, that break in the roof, which would have been devastating for the entire Metro Denver area. And indeed, it was the Atomic Energy Commission that said later in the report that we came within seconds of a Chernobyl-like incident, and it was um, just these these acts, intentional and otherwise, of the firefighters that prevented that. So you you mentioned that you wouldn't be talking to me, and and actually I wouldn't be listening either because I grew up about maybe five six miles north of the plant, and mm. um, just west of Louisville, east of Boulder, and um, and I drove I drove on the road east of Rocky Flats every day. I went to the School of Mines and. Um, which you know also, and um, anyway, I I uh, I lived at home, and so I drove that every day for four years. And my point in bringing that up is just to reinforce that um, the lack of awareness on the part of the public that you're sitting there having having Mother's Day brunch, and I was presumably doing something for Mother's Day too. And mm-hmm. um, and there was a complete lack of of significant notification. Um, and I just once again, I wish I could say I find that extraordinary. Um, and let's talk let's talk for a second about the the location of the plant that that when you talk about it being um, there being a cloud passing overhead. Um, can we talk for a moment about the prevailing winds in that area and where um, Rocky Flats is located concerning metropolitan areas? Mm-hmm. Well, it's an interesting thing. Um, for one thing, uh, at many of the other atomic sites or nuclear sites, uh, Los Alamos in particular, but also places like Oak Ridge, at least in the early years, uh, if you worked at Los Alamos, for example, you lived at Los Alamos. It was kind of a closed uh, community, and um, and uh, there were very few people in the local population who really knew about it or who worked up there. And Rocky Flats was different. Um, it was not any sort of closed community in that way. It was entirely dependent upon local population for workers. And Rocky Flats employed a lot of people. Uh, When I worked at the plant myself, there were more than 6,000 people working at Rocky Flats. So it was a very important um, employer in the area, which they used as justification to keep things going, I think, for a lot longer than than it should have gone on, certainly. Uh, But... um, So the AEC, when it first built the plant in the 1950s, it was uh, faced with a dilemma. On the one hand, they knew, they knew very well that this was a highly dangerous plant. Um, And uh, there was not only the risk of accident and even potential criticality, uh, but also that this was going to be 
you know, th- this was the Cold War. This plant was going to be number one on the list uh, for the Soviets in terms of a target. The rest of the um, nuclear weapon system in the United States was entirely dependent upon Rocky Flats because we were the only ones making plutonium triggers. The plutonium came from Hanford, and then uh, after they were uh, created at Rocky Flats, they went down to the Pantex facility in Texas where they were encased in conventional explosives and actually became, you know, the actual bomb. Um, But we were it. Uh, So that's another reason why that uh, location is is very important. And, of course, no one in a local population knew any of this. Uh, The original engineering report for Rocky Flats contained an error. Uh, It was based on wind patterns from the old Stapleton Airport, perhaps. (laughs) I'm sure you remember Stapleton. Um, And uh, rather than the wind patterns of where it is located now. And there was a worker... A whistleblower by the name of Jim Stone who pointed out that error and uh, he was ignored. The Jim Stone story is, is a whole other story that we could certainly get into. Um, but uh, they continued to build the plant on the site that they had chosen, which is just north of Denver, just down the road from Golden and Boulder, a very highly populated area even in, at that time and a growing area just as it is today. And the problem with that location in the winds is that it's a high plateau, beautiful area, as you know, gorgeous, gorgeous. Um, And uh, it gets a lot of wind and rain and snow, pretty extreme weather. And the winds come down off the mountains, these Chinook winds, very um, hot, uh, high-moving winds. They come down off the mountains and sweep across that land and will pick up whatever is on that land and carry it over the Metro Denver area. And uh, that's something that's been going on since the 1950s and continues to the present day. And as you know, the wind out there, it was very common for workers to have their windshields blown out or the side windows in their cars. The wind is really strong. Um, the, The phone crapped out for just a moment when you said the wind is... And I believe you said very strong. Really strong, really strong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I remember when I was a child, we would have days off from school because the wind was so high. It would be 120 miles an hour and people would lose their roofs. It's, so, so let's just be really explicit. What they did is put a, a site that works with perhaps the most toxic material known on the planet – that is toxic in tiny, tiny, tiny quantities directly upwind of a major metropolitan area. That is absolutely correct. <laughs> <laughs> and we are we are uh, suffering the um, the health effects and and I would say even the historical, cultural, and psychological effects of that to the present day. Well, you said we were suffering that, and that reminds me of a line from 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 your book that's just. just I mean, there's so many beautiful, beautiful lines in there, but I want to I want to read a couple lines to you and just have you respond to them. And it's from page 338. The body is an organ of memory holding traces of all our experiences. The land, too, carries the burden of all its changes. To truly see and understand a landscape is to see its depth as well as its smooth surfaces, its beauty and its scars. Um, and I think that's pretty self self-sufficient, but would you talk about that for a moment anyway? Yeah, well, um, I will reference the title of the book, uh, Full Body Burden, which is a technical term uh, used to, it refers to how much plutonium can be, quote-unquote, safely held within the body. And, of course, there is no safe level, uh, even though we have levels for exposure for workers and for residents. And, oh, by the way, those levels keep going up. Uh, and this is happening in places like Fukushima as well. Um, they keep you know, changing and raising it, kind of depending upon what's happening. But, but the truth is that there is no safe level of exposure to plutonium. Full body burden is a term that refers to the situation when a worker, for example, has received uh, so much exposure or contamination um, that they can no longer work in a hot area. And of course, no um, worker wanted to be, 
very few workers wanted to reach that point for all sorts of reasons, but one reason was also just plain practical. Um, there were a lot of workers who were making mortgage payments, of course, and putting their kids to college, and, and if you had a high body burden or a full body burden, you would um, be put into an area where you would make less money. You know, um, the highest paid areas were in the uh, hot areas. So anyway, there's kind of a story behind that. But I really saw, <clears throat> I really see the body and uh, and the environment as being connected uh, metaphorically and in a very, very direct way. And uh, this is what, what we have done. We have injured our, our planet. We've injured the land. And we've injured ourselves. And um, And these are injuries of a very long-lasting nature, unfortunately. And so it's absolutely necessary for us culturally and politically and historically to open our eyes and look at the story and look at what happened and deal with the consequences instead of kind of keeping our blinders on and pretending like it didn't happen. And if we don't look at it, it will go away because it won't. You know, this, this is this whole notion of not really looking at what's happening is something that I I deal with in in every book and you know I I've got a dear friend who lives in um Fort Lauderdale and she talks about how there's full recognition that the sea levels are rising but that so far does not really seem to have affected real estate values of people are still buying houses on the water, even though now the tides are coming literally to their front door. And I, I, I mean, you can interrupt me at any point to just say whatever you want about this. I'm just, I, you know, I, I've been reading lately about how there are all sorts of stolid scientists who are saying that the oceans could be devoid of fish within 35 years. And I, I, I and I, you know, I'm, you know, I've written 20-some books about this, and I'm still pretty speechless. Or one more thing. It's like, you know, the Arctic is, is in big trouble, and it's the, the Arctic ice cap is, 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 is melting, and the response by those in power has really been lust for the minerals that are opening up, and now they're going to do a luxury cruise to the Northwest Passage. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't, I don't, I mean... You've you've written about this on a very personal level too, and and it's it's um, it's making me think of something else you said about a less than a generation. We've almost forgotten what happened at Rocky Flats, and why it must never ha- must never happen again. And um, you say people will build homes and businesses and roads and parks on land tainted by an invisible and invincible demon, and no one will know. And I mean, so just yeah, just take off with this anywhere you'd want to go. It's, I, <laughs> well, I'm 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 glad you you brought up that last statement. I mean, that's exactly what's happening. Uh, if you drive out to the Rocky Flat site right now, you will see um, all sorts of new subdivisions going up, uh, new hiking trails going into land um, that uh, has is contaminated. Um, part of the reason why some of it was declared open space is that it was too contaminated to build on. Uh, and if you go out there uh, right now, there are no signs, no warnings. Um, you know, people are moving to Colorado to this particular area from all over the country. It's a beautiful place to live. The landscape is gorgeous. It's 10 minutes to Boulder, 20 minutes to Denver. Uh, great location. Um, and uh, I, people who move into the area uh, and buy one of these brand new houses. And some of these houses, ironically, are green houses, energy efficient houses, that sort of thing. But they're built on contaminated land. The developers are under no obligation to tell potential home buyers that uh, the land is contaminated, or that these houses are located directly adjacent to a former nuclear weapons site. And uh, 1,300 acres of that site is still a super fun site super fun site and so profoundly contaminated that they can never open to the public. The rest of that 6,000 acre site is contaminated, um, but you wouldn't know it. There are no signs. There's nothing up there to let people know what happened. So people who move in from out of state and buy a home there, they don't know. And um, this happens every time I, I do a reading or a presentation in Colorado. Someone will come up and they'll be just 
uh, devastated. They said, oh, we moved here you know, from California. I'm married with two kids. Uh, we just found out that our house is built on contaminated land, and we don't want to live here. We don't want to raise our kids here. And yet um, we put our entire life savings down into the down payment on this house. And what do we do if we if we if we uh, talk about Rocky Flats and how the land was contaminated? No one will buy the house. But we don't want to. You know, it's it's a catch twenty two. It's a terrible situation. I think probably there's um, another yet another lawsuit <laughs> brewing here at some point. But in the meantime, um, there's no way that people would know. Now, on the other hand, what I really want to talk about is the people who do know, and um, and turn the other way or uh, won't really look at the evidence uh, or think, as my family did for many, many years, you know, plutonium, what's plutonium? <laughs> you can't see it. You can't smell it. You can't taste it. Um, you know, we're going on with our day-to-day -day activities. And yes, maybe there's some cancer in the neighborhood, but who knows? And, and you just sort of carry on and you don't think about it. You don't want to deal with it. And I, I think it's perhaps part of the human psyche uh, to these problems are so enormous um, climate problems um, what's happening with the environment and, and radioactive and toxic contamination I think people if they start to think about it they're overwhelmed by it and they don't know how what to do with it so what can I do on a day-to-day -day basis it's it's just too much so I'm just gonna look the other way um, maybe that's too easy of an answer, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. There are a lot of people in Colorado who knew about Rocky Flats, who know about Rocky Flats, and were willing to just look the other way. And of course, there's a very strong profit motive for uh, businesses, business people, um, and corporations who build out there, and then also the, all the, of these uh, home builders out there. Yeah, and you know, I'm thinking about myself that I was not particularly politicized in my early 20s and um, late teens, and I remember occasionally seeing protesters out in front of Rocky Flats, and I, um, driving by every day, I was curious, but I was never curious enough to actually look stuff up, you know. I mean, so, mm -hmm. so I was, you know, so many of us just sort of like you're saying, we just get through the day. And, you know, I had enough enough going on with trying to get through the School of Mines in four years. And mm -hmm. um, in retrospect, it's kind of silly. Once again, even on a personal level, driving by there every single day. Um, but I'm, I'm just, I'm just, yeah. I'm just expressing some, you know, I have no sympathy whatsoever for the, for the actual um, bureaucrats and the people who did not do studies who should have, the actual people who should have known. I, I'm just expressing a little bit of sympathy, a little bit, not much, but a little bit of sympathy <laughs> for for th those of us who did see the protesters and had the opportunity to look, but didn't bother because we were too busy trying to get to school by 8 o'clock in the morning. Exactly. I mean, I think that's, mo that's most people. It's, that was certainly me for a long, long time. And uh, I, I think it's also important to note how Rocky Flats has – divided um, people in Colorado for a long time. And of course, the broader nuclear issues have divided this country for a long time. But just talking about Rocky Flats, um, in terms of people who live nearby, there were some people who protested. Actually, some of the um, protests out there were huge, thousands and thousands of people who came from all over the country. And then there were many, many smaller protests, and those continue to the present day. Um, and then there were a lot of people who thought the protesters were a little crazy. And my father was one of those people. He would, he would you know, we would drive past them, and, and I was a kid or a teenager, and he would say, oh, look, there they go again. And he would say, and this is actually, a, I think, a chapter title in my book, Hippies, Housewives. <laughs> and, you know, we think these are people who don't have a job. They don't know what they're talking about, you know, um, and he would marginalize them. And I didn't know enough uh, or really, you know, bother to, to look into it at that point in time either. I thought, oh, well, my dad says, you know. <laughs> and, um, and so it divided our community in that way, and it also divided the workers and, and continues to do so at the present day. Of course, many workers got sick. Many workers um, were contaminated. Many workers died. Uh, and then there were some workers who did not get sick, some workers who um, – 
had a good job for 30 years and high paying, great benefits. Um, and they, you know, they were happy with that and proud of the work that they did. And then there were other workers who had very mixed feelings uh, and misgivings about what was going on out there. And, and then those who got sick. And so there was a lot of um, division, divisiveness within the workers as well as uh, among the residential community and broader community around Colorado. And I think a lot of that continues to the present day too. You know, this is this is all something that we see so often in capitalism and is a, is, a, is a structural problem with this whole system that you see loggers whose lives, and I've lived in logging towns, so you see loggers whose lives, whose livelihood, sorry, there's a big, a big difference there, and that's the problem, isn't it, that we confuse mm-hmm. livelihood and lives. But anyway, um, there are loggers whose livelihoods depend upon them, you know, destroying the land base where they've lived for generations. And we see this with military people, uh, military uh, people who work for military companies, you know, that their, their, their livelihoods, they are, they're putting food on the table for their children by making bombs that kill other children. And right. this is a big problem in, in capitalism itself, that we, are, we end up oftentimes getting rewarded personally and socially for socially destructive behaviors. And that's one of the things that ends up creating that dissonance that we're really talking about here, where you do have to put on the blinders to not see so that you can... What's that great line by um, oh, Upton Sinclair? Um, it's hard to make a man understand something when his job depends on him not understanding it. Exactly. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, that's exactly right. And and one thing we saw at Rocky Flats that is uh, true for other um, other nuclear communities as well um, is that you know it was a it was a good job it was a respected job no one talked about what they did you couldn't talk about what you did and I mean can you imagine going to work for 30 years and coming home for dinner every night and you, you couldn't tell your spouse or your children what you did at work that day I think that's part of the reason why we have so many rumors had so many rumors about what was going on out there some of it was that we were literally fed misinformation or received no information. And then the other thing I think uh, is that workers and workers have said this to me. Um, I had to tell my kids something. So I told them that we were making glass doorknobs or buttons or, or yo-yos or whatever. You know, people came up with all sorts of, all sorts of things. And then there's also um, the, the kind of implied promise of not only a very good job, but a permanent job. And people who worked at Rocky Flats, I, I knew many of them. I understood why they felt this way. It was a real sense of family. Uh, a lot of those people were hired directly out of high school, from Golden High School or Nevada High School or whatever. Um, and then they were trained at the plant, and then they, they, you know, became workers. Either, you know, many people started in the cafeteria, and then eventually went on to become radiation monitors or whatever. And and there was the promise of a permanent job that this would be a job for life that we will, you know, we will take care of you. In fact, when Dow Chemical was uh, operating the plant, workers referred to it as Mother Dow. It was it was a very kind of um, you know paternalistic family like uh, situation and people knew that um, you know for that loyalty and silence silencing they would be rewarded with a job and most likely a lifetime job. So there's we have about um, about twelve or thirteen minutes left and there's a few directions I'd like to go and. One of them is um, that what I I, want to ask both about what do you see for the future of Rocky Flats itself, but I don't want to just focus on that alone because your work is about so much more than just Rocky Flats, but the larger full body burden and we could say full earth burden, you know? Mm-hmm. And so so what I guess there this is this is usually sort of an end of interview question. We still have a little while left, so I want to ask this and then you can just take it however you want. That that what what do you want what is the larger lesson that you want 
listeners of this interview and readers of your of your work to take away in terms of their relationship with whatever is going on with the land where they live and and I do want to come back to rocky flats but but what is the larger the larger lesson about relationships lessons plural about relationships to land and to one's own body that you would really like to um to pass on to people mm. That's a great question. Well, I think, you know, the first thing is is to pay attention, you know, to wake up and pay attention um, to where you live right now, what's happening in your uh, particular area. And people don't know. Um, I travel all over the country speaking to different universities. Um, many universities have uh, adopted full body burden for their first year experience common read programs which is just wonderful i get to talk to a lot of students a lot of faculty in different fields and that sort of thing and we begin by talking about rocky flats but then i will say do you know what's right here in in your area is there a nuclear site is there a chemical site uh is there a nuclear power plant nearby have there been problems with that nuclear power plant and most people don't know um, they're just not aware because it's not something that we see in the news. It's not something that's on, uh, you know, on the internet on a regular basis or whatever. You have to look for it because no one is eager to talk about those things, particularly the companies involved. And if you don't look for it, uh, you won't know. And if you don't know, there is a price to pay, um, you know, culturally, historically, socially, and all that. But most uh, importantly, in terms of health effect. Uh, and particularly if you have small children. I, I feel so strongly with Rocky Flats in particular. Uh, no one with uh, small children. Small children should not be anywhere near that site. They are the, they're the most vulnerable. So I think the first thing is to figure out what's going on in your own backyard. It took me a long time to figure out. In fact, it was kind of funny. I was working as a travel. I worked as a travel writer in Europe for many years. And and spent a lot of time trotting around the globe trying to find good things to write about before I realized that the most important story that I had to tell was quite literally in my own backyard, like in the soil of my own backyard. And uh, it, was, it, it, it was hard to see that at first. I wasn't aware of it. I had to, you know, 10 years of research went into this book. It was a huge, huge project. So I think the first thing is to find out what's happening where you live right now. There's, uh, I might add real quick, there's a map on my website and also um, uh, on my Facebook author page that shows all of the nuclear sites around the country. I think people tend to think, oh, Rocky Flats, that happened in Colorado a long time ago. Um, and I live here and there's nothing going on here. Uh, for example, I just moved to Cincinnati where I'm teaching now at the University of Cincinnati and the Fernald site is just up the road. One of the most important nuclear sites in the country and the first site, uh, the first instance where people were able to win a class action lawsuit and get public health monitoring and public um, support for health issues. So it's a very important site. Um, but a lot of people don't know about that. So what, you figure out what's going on in your own backyard and then you have to be willing to speak up about it. And I think now more than ever, it's it's easier to speak up. I mean, you don't have to sit down and write a letter necessarily to your representative or, or whatever. Um, we've got Facebook. We've got Twitter. Uh, I was a slow convert to Twitter, but I've um, been to Washington, D.C. several times and, and seen things change in the moment. If there's an, enough um, public outcry over an issue happening on Twitter, believe it or not, um, Governor Roy Romer, who was governor of Colorado during the FBI raid on Rocky Flats in 1989, one thing that, that he said that I think is so, so true, he said, if people don't speak up, if they don't pay attention and speak up, then politicians don't even know to respond. Now, perhaps, obviously, they know something about Rocky Flats, but if nobody's paying attention and nobody cares about what happens out there, they're not going to do anything. They're going to follow the money or whatever. Um, so I think, you know, find out what's happening in your own backyard and then be willing to speak up about it and make well, it make the part of your life. And that, that goes to um, the last sentence of the book, which I think is one of the best last sentences of any book around, um, which is to speak out or to remain silent is the first and most crucial decision we can make. 
I, I think that's that's I think that's absolutely true, and uh, it certainly is um, is true not just at Rocky Flats but other nuclear and, and toxic and radioactive sites around the world. One thing that's really encouraging to me to see uh, in Fukushima, um, despite the ongoing tragedy there and the misinformation and lack of information that the Japanese people have about Fukushima and the rest of the world. Uh, this is not a problem that's, that's gone away, that's, that's going away. It's an, it's an ongoing, continuous problem, as is Hanford, I should add. <laughs> it's not just other countries. We have plenty of that in our own country. Uh, but there are people in Fukushima living in the area who are blogging, who are traveling around the world and talking about what's happening to the children there, what's happening to the environment, what's happening to the animals, to the insects. Um, and I find that very, very uh, encouraging, working with those kinds of people who are willing to take a stand and talk about what's happening and get their voice out into the world. Well, we've got like like uh, three or four minutes left, and I think you've kind of answered this, but well, actually, let's go a different direction for a second. What about Rocky Flats itself? Now that we've talked about the big thing, and I want to come back to the big the big picture in a second, but what about Rocky Flats itself? Is there is there what would you see as a best case scenario for the future of that contamination and the future mm-hmm. of of the Rocky Flats area itself? Mm-hmm. Well, the way it stands now, it's a 6,000 acre site. 1,300 acres, as I mentioned earlier, are so profoundly contaminated that they can never open to the public, although they continue to pose a danger. For example, we had big floods um, in Colorado last fall, you may recall, and the entire site was flooded and one of the caps on uh, one of those areas cracked. There's much concern about um, off-site contamination anytime there's a, a flood or wind or anything like that, so it continues to be a problem. The rest of the site is slated to open uh, as public uh, a public recreation area for hiking and biking and um, possibly even hunting. They were talking about at one point, even though there is plutonium. Plutonium has been found in the bodies of deer. Um, And my own personal opinion is that given the studies that have been done so far, and they're minimal, we need more studies, given the studies that have been done so far, um, I think that site, the entire site, should be permanently closed to the public. And I think a number of experts would agree with me on that. At the very minimum, we need to inform people about this, you know, before you decide to, if if it does open to the public, before you decide to let your third grader go out on a field trip to the Rocky Flats (laughs) National Wildlife Refuge, you should know that there is still plutonium and all sorts of other stuff out there. And maybe you don't want your third grader to go. so uh, there's got to be more public information. Uh, we've got to deal with this question of, of development. I'll just mention very briefly, um, Dr. Carl Johnson was the first um, health director of Jefferson County. This was going all the way back to the late 70s uh, when they started building very, very close to the plant and a bunch of developers um, presented him with building uh, permits and that sort of thing. and. They did a bunch of study and found plutonium in the soil, and Dr. Carl Johnson said um, there should be no, I will not approve any uh, permit within 10 miles of Rocky Flats, and and I would recommend that there be no building within 30 miles of Rocky Flats. What happened to Carl Johnson was that um, eventually he was fired for opposing home development, although he later won a whistleblower lawsuit, but he was fired and building uh, continued. So I go back to his words and and his studies, which were later verified by the Department of Energy with respect to what contamination is out there, and we should not be building close to that site. And if we are going to build out there, people should know what they're getting into at the very minimum. I think it should be declared, my own desire would be that we declare it uh, what others have called a national sacrifice zone. And that's what um, a number of scientists and engineers and physicists and others thought that it should be called when they were first talking about closing down the plant uh, and, quote, unquote, cleaning it up. This is a deeply contaminated area. Let's just close it, keep it closed off to the public and call it a national sacrifice zone. You know, I think think I'd like to close with um, a line that I read that somebody said soon after 
or during the Bhopal catastrophe, which was um, they were saying that the corporations or anybody should not be allowed to make poisons for which there is no antidote. And it's a very simple line, but that's always really struck me as one of the most profound and wise things I've ever heard in my life. Mm -hmm. And I think when you talk about the inability to decontaminate, it just seems to me this is, this is a fundamental lesson that people are supposed to learn early in life is you don't make messes that can't be cleaned up. <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. I agree with that completely. And and then there's a little bit of a complication to that, at least with respect to how we deal with it in this country, and that is that uh, we have a piece of um, legislation called the Price-Anderson Act, and that act, um, which uh, started way back in the I mean, late 1940s, early 1950s, that protects corporations who go into the nuclear industry. It essentially indemnifies them or protects them from uh, any liability, legal liability, if something goes awry, if something goes wrong, if there is a catastrophe. Uh, who who pays for that? Who pays for the cleanup? Well, we do, the taxpayers. Um, so I think there's a real question of, of um, who's responsible here. And the reason that the reason the Price-Anderson Act is in effect, and it was just recently renewed for another 25 years, is that uh, if it weren't for that, no one would go into the nuclear business. It's too dangerous. It's too expensive. It has to be um, subsidized by the federal government, and uh, and it's just, it's too dangerous. Uh, no one would do it. Well, so maybe who, who who bears the responsibility? You know, who who takes responsibility for this? Just a thought. Maybe if it's too dangerous, it shouldn't be done. Exactly. <laughs> well, we're out of time. And so on that note, um, thank you so much for everything you had to say. It's, it's so great. And Well, it's, it's terrible, but you, thank you. Your, your interview is great. It's just a terrible, terrible subject. Um, oh, I know. It's sad. It's a sad story. It's a sad subject. Yeah. And, and so thank you very much for listening. My guest today has been Kristen Iverson. This is Derek Jensen, Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. 